Hello, and welcome to ATF, After the Fire, a post-line-of-duty death firefighter podcast brought to you by the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation in collaboration with FirefighterSkills.com. I'm your host, John Nelson. Before we get into today's episode, we just want to remind you that if you enjoy the After the Fire podcast, please tell your friends and family about it. Take a screenshot, post it on your social media accounts, and tag at Fire Hero for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation and tag at Firefighter Skills for FirefighterSkills.com. We really appreciate your support. You can always leave us a review on iTunes as well if that's where you listen. And if you're interested in getting in touch with us about NFFF services or anything regarding the podcast, or if you just want to drop us a line or a suggestion, feel free to hit us up at AfterTheFirePodcast.com or on social media at Firefighter Skills. Let's get into episode four, where we continue discussing the 1984 Phoenix Fire Department LODD of hazmat engineer Ricky Pierce and today's unknown hazard, lithium ion batteries. Our panel includes current Surprise Arizona Fire Department Chief Tom Abbott, retired Phoenix Fire Department Assistant Fire Chief Ron Jamison, retired Phoenix Fire Captain and Officer of Engineer Ricky Pierce that day in 1984, Tom Bates, son of the late Ricky Pierce and current Phoenix Fire Department Captain Chris Pierce, and the Director of Fire Education Programs at National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, John Tippett. Feel free to check out afterthefirepodcast.com where you can find all external links mentioned in this episode and more. Now, without further ado, Episode 4, Part 2 of the 1984 LODD of Phoenix Fire Department's hazmat engineer, Ricky Pierce. Guys, considering today's firefighters and the way that we do things, we look at this event in 1984 with hindsight bias and think, how could this have happened? Of course, with the Emergency Response Guide app on our phones and the internet and other citable sources, we know better now. However, we aren't necessarily, nor will we ever be out of the woods when it comes to these unknowns. Because typically the first thing someone does when they don't know what to do in an emergency is call 911 and expect firefighters and first responders to show up and know what to do. It's not that far-fetched to say that due to these unknowns, we could easily see a repeat of what happened to Engineer Pierce and his fellow firefighters that day in 1984. Case in point, about a year or so ago in Surprise, Arizona, we had a double near miss with the explosion of a lithium-ion battery storage facility. That incident was on April 19th, 2019, so less than a year ago. Surprise, Arizona Fire Department Chief Tom Abbott. But it was, when you look at the aftermath of what took place, that looked very similar to what transpired in 19, November of 1984 with Chris's dad. Uh, helmets completely ripped off the heads of uh, four firefighters. Uh, SCBA backpacks broken in several pieces. Uh, and this is current technology. Uh, took the packs, broke them. Um, it propelled a, a company officer from Peoria, which is a part, you know, the hazmat group, uh, engine 193, uh, propelled the captain 73 feet after he went underneath uh, an industrial chain link fence. The engineer wound up 50 feet away from the, the building. Both had very significant injuries, uh, clavicles, scapulas, ribs, uh, bilateral fractures of the ankles, uh, chemical burns on the face. Um, different kinds of burns, and they were fully turned out. They had all their protective clothing on, and that obviously is what saved them. But uh, this was a, uh, for lack of a better description, a Connex box um, that was filled with lithium-ion batteries to store power during the day, capture power from um, photovoltaic systems, and then to put that electricity back into the system in the evenings when peak demand came on. Um, and that's the way of the future. They're all over the country now, and this only need to become more prevalent, and especially as people, uh, not only do the utility companies are getting into this, uh, individuals are getting into it. And what, uh, you know, unfortunately I see happening in the future that's going to become the challenge for firefighters is as these different um, 
battery systems, and there's all kinds of technologies for the battery. Uh, there's flow batteries, mechanical batteries, there's uh, lithium ion, there's regular lithium batteries, but a lithium and a lithium ion battery, totally different, totally different chemistries. But there's, there's several different ways of uh, storing energy. But you're going to see a huge increase, even with the Department of Energy's expectations, uh, in by the year 2025, they're going to be um, exponential growth in sales and use of lithium-ion batteries, especially in residential applications, in addition to just the utility companies, uh, the communications companies, uh, replacing lead-acid technology with lithium-ion. Transportation. Transportation. Uh, we've, there's an electric fire truck out in the market right now. Yeah. It's relatively expensive right now, but in, in the future, that cost is going to come down. And so we'll be probably progressing in that direction. But the, what people don't understand is how the, mo- how the individual cells are put into a battery, then uh, created a module, and then you put several modules together and you get a rack and you get a utility-grade system, or just taking one module, putting in somebody's uh, residence to capture uh, electricity from whatever source. And then we have a, uh, about 460 degrees Fahrenheit um, these, one of the cells or a couple of the cells can go in what's called thermal runaway and propagate to the cell next to it. And, and you wind up off-gassing uh, all the different lithium fluoride salts that exist within these cells and all the different electrolyte solutions which produce uh, flammable vapor. So if you've got something like that in a garage, the, the battery itself can fail. But it can also have a garage fire for another reason and cause that battery to go into uh, thermal runaway. Now, the question is, we uh, normal, op- I shouldn't say normal, but we, we extinguish the fire through taking a, a garage attack or however you approach garage fires. You put it out and you have this uh, lithium ion battery sitting on the wall inside the garage. What do you do with it? Whether it's gone through thermal runaway or not, you've got incredible quantities of electricity stored inside that unit. Um, And they're all uh, capable of going through thermal runaway at any point in time. It could be after you put the fire out, it might be two hours later, it reignites, two days, two weeks, two months. One of the uh, batteries that were in the site, uh, the Micken site, from what we understand, was transported back to a laboratory in Michigan for uh, forensic analysis to figure out what went wrong, what caused that battery to fail, or that cell, the individual cells. They were transporting the one of the cells in the laboratory in De- in Michigan in December, so nine months later, and it ignited. It ignited uh, eight nine months later, so it gives you an indication of what can happen with these things. Now, the question I would ask for the future of the, of the fire service, what are we going to do with these batteries when they fail? Are we going to take a, a pry bar and pull them off the wall? Um, are we going to call somebody? And then if so, who? Because we're the ones that are supposedly called to provide a solution. So what do we do with them? How do we approach them? Uh, knowing that you put all that flammable gas off and you fill up a garage with that gas with the door down in fairly tight seal and it gets in the middle of the flammable range, kind of like the toluene tank incident and where that we've been talking about, that finds a source of ignition as it's building up gas and it's in the middle of the explosive range and that door comes off. And if you've parked the fire truck right in front of it, in front of that garage, now what? You have firefighters standing out in front of that door. So there's, it's fraught with problems going forward into the future. But how do we address that? How do we develop policies uh, for us MPs to address that battery that's sitting inside the, the house when it's been through a, a thermal event? Um, what do we do with it? How do we manage it? Um, we're on a large scale with a utility-grade system that we're inevitably going to encounter again. This was just the first time something like that had been documented in the United States where it exploded 
and the conditions were just right. We theorize right now, and this is not proven by any stretch of the imagination, but we theorize it was above the upper explosive limit, and it was uh, the vapor, uh, when they opened the door, air came in, and the reduction of, because uh, this event occurred three hours after the fact, this explosion took place, that and when they opened the door, it potentially went right back down into the right in the middle of the flammable range, and there was all kinds of ignition sources inside the facility. It ignited and it detonated, and technically, it's not a detonation by the true sense of the word; it's a rapid deflagration. But it had enough force to propel an adult male fire captain 73 feet after undergoing going underneath a fence and tearing his SCBA harness and the backpack in pieces, and he's in full gear. Technology is always going to be a challenge, right? We faced uh, technology challenges when they started doing uh, refrigerated carbon dioxide in all, all the restaurants and stuff. They, they, no one came to the fire department and talked to us. Retired Phoenix Fire Department Assistant Chief Ron Jamison. These companies started installing them, and we found out about it after the fact uh, based on incidents. We responded to incidents. We got people down. They got fatalities in Texas. We had an incident here in Phoenix. McDonald's. That, uh, McDonald's. Where some people were exposed in the McDonald's in a basement, which we don't have very many of here. And the potential was there. Because of that call, we made a video and put it on YouTube and sh showed what we found. Uh, that triggered some investigations other places and determined this, that these fatalities were caused by the same thing. Uh, we changed our fire code. Uh, to require them to have uh, steel braided lines instead of plastic lines for refrigerated liquids and, and the way they use them in, in town. So detection we, systems. Yeah, the detection systems. They had them, but uh, uh, there were no requirements in the fire code for what these people would do. There's no requirements in the fire code for what they're going to do with these electrical systems. Well, we changed the, the fire code recently, last uh, June and August, as a result of that incident. But it remains to be seen if, as we develop these things, is that pre prevent another catastrophic event? Right. Well, that's a prototype, too. So we don't know that they're going to use some, something this much different and call it something else. And there's black markets now available. You can buy uh, these modules on eBay. And we have yet to really experience that problem. But from my understanding, that's, that is a huge issue in the United Kingdom. We, we have the same issue with uh, marijuana grow houses, right? They're, they're reducing the amount of O2 in the air. They have... Uh, they have low-hanging stuff in there. You go in there and search for You think it's a regular house and it's illegal operations. I mean, we've always faced those kind of issues with illicit drug labs or, or various things like that, right? Now that they're being uh, regulated, they make them change the electrical system there in their house and, and in the facility, right? I mean, they're upgrading it to help keep us safer. But we have to rely on the, on the fire code uh, to protect us. And we, but before we can do that, we have to know about it. They brought this material into, into Chief Abbott's uh, city, and they didn't ask anybody. It was on their property, and they're doing their own R and D, and they're saying we don't need permission to do it. You know, it's our facility. So, and we didn't know that it existed, and what we found out. How much right does the fire department have to, or, or code enforcement to drive around and and find these potential hazards, or to inquire about personal property? We're like, oh, that's that looks suspicious. We may have to fight a fire here. What's going on? Personal property wise, virtually done. Uh, you know, we still it's, it's still a, man, a man's home is his castle, right? He can kind of do what he wants there. Uh, now they found people that had you know illegal fuel storage in their in their backyard and stuff like that. If we find out about that. We'll go in there and shut them down, force them to clean it up. But but the big thing is, is you're not going to find out until there's an incident. And what you and I think what you can see though uh, going forward, I believe the International Association of Firefighters has uh, made a commitment to developing uh, training programs for all these different battery systems, battery storage systems, um, and responses and stuff like that um, in conjunction with Underwriters Laboratory, the National Fire Protection Association. So training is going to be developed and brought online to help us understand these systems better. Because once again, like any hazard, if you don't understand it, that's and what can go wrong and how to fix it. This one, we have problems. But as we become more and more familiar with these systems, I think we'll be better equipped to uh, manage an incident with them. And are there any other hazards that you guys have kind of heard about or foreseen or anticipate coming down the pike that you know could make things complicated for us? Outside energy storage systems? That's the big one right now. 
right? Uh, so we dealt with it when they came out with electric vehicles and, and how we do extrication, and, w- and when they did all the all the airbags in the in the in the columns, you know, the A posts and the B posts and stuff. We had to change our tactics to accommodate to that. So we're we're pretty. I mean, we're flexible. We well, we're kind of the the, the shell answer man for whatever's going wrong. They're going to call us, and, and we deal with those things. We learn quickly, and we share our information now. Uh, system-wide, nationwide. We're much better shares than we were in days of past, so we'll get that information out there. Speaking of, do you guys have any classes or programs that Inquiring Minds could access right now? Reach out to uh, the International Association of Firefighters as Drills Training Department. Uh, it's on their website. There's a lot of uh, web-based curriculum already there that uh, members can uh log in and take the class and get credit for it. There's uh, the IFF will come out and actually train people that make a request. You can, NFPA has an online course on fo- photovoltaic systems that uh, somewhat addresses uh, like lithium ion uh, battery storage and some of the other technologies that exist. There's going to be, this is kind of the newest thing per se, as uh, Chief Jameson just alluded to, so I see a lot of things, a lot of different groups will be focusing in on what um, what could be done and how best to do it, what tactics and strategy we can use uh, to address and manage these problems. Let's say the firefighters out there listening, one day they're met with a hazard and they don't know what the answer is. What's the best course of action? I mean, it's in our nature to want to do something, but what if we don't know what to do? Action feels good. Inaction feels horrible. We're action oriented, right? So we'll do we'll do things, and sometimes we'll do stupid things before we'll do nothing. Uh, that's one of the things that we we'd like to try to train out of our people. We want you to be we want them to be thinkers, right? We want to and you know to actually look at it. You know, in the days of old, you'd run towards a you'd run towards a building on fire with your hose line, and, and it would be we refer to it as candle moth syndrome. And uh, you know, then we taught them to start thinking about building construction and looking at the hazards as they approach the structure, and where's most likely place for someone to be. Reading uh, the smoke, reading, looking at your smoke. Yeah, dealing with the, the the smoke, right? Actually using all their personal protective equipment. That was a big one for us for a long time, because we had we our culture. We have a we have a fantastic culture in the fire service, right? And it has good aspects, positive aspects, and it has some negatives, right? And we try to wean those out, but sometimes we have to almost. Uh, almost wait for the for the uh, evolutionary change to happen right we have to grow out through these things right uh, there's certain parts of the country that that adapted to wearing personal protective clothing a lot faster than other parts of the country right some people were wearing those SBAs for ballast right but they didn't want to breathe that canned air uh, you know so we've come a long way I think we'll continue to to, to move forward uh, our, our firefighters our young firefighters they're super well educated they're smart uh, they have access to information that we didn't have when we were when we were young firefighters. Uh, so uh, you can't, you know, ain't no, there's no fooling them, right? And uh, they'll they'll do their own research, and it's good. It pushes us to be it pushes us to to be better. Yeah, well, going back just a second on one of the things that you talked about that is um, probably one of the most critical component is what we're doing now to. Uh, address uh, cancer prevention and avoidance. Uh, we've, through the Phoenix Fire Department and uh, the Metropolitan Phoenix area and, uh, and other parts of the country as well, uh, they've moved into, we do decon, uh, decontamination after a structure fire. You come out, we've got procedures now for that have been implemented that you clean off, uh, rinse off and scrub and package your turnout gear put it outside of the the truck, uh, get it back to the station, get a second set of turnout gear, uh, new types of hoods that are particle hoods that um, capture the the smoke particulates so that you're not breathing or getting into your neck and the lymphatic system uh, for some of the carcinogens in the smoke. Um, So we're we're designing stations now with, uh, quote, if, if you want to carry the, the hot, warm, cold zone to uh, uh, the actual design of fire stations. The apparatus room is considered a hot zone. There's a warm zone where you walk in off the apparatus room after a structure fire. Uh, you get out of your, uh, you dress your gear and stuff like that. You come inside and you immediately go into uh, shower stalls that we're building. Uh, and at the, once you come out of that, uh, you take a dirty uniform. At the end of that hallway is a, uh, washer and dryer so you put your uniforms in there and you clean them 
then you're allowed to go into the rest of the fire station. And so they're, your warm zone is your uh, decontamination showers. Then you go into the sh- station, there's your cold zone. And there's regular shower stalls and bathrooms inside the fire station as well. But the, uh, the, the showers in off the apparatus room are uh, to reduce, so that's the warm zone, that's to reduce contamination. That's what you uh, use those shower stalls for. So we're doing a lot of things to um, address being uh, exposed to a lot of the carcinogens. But it becomes an it becomes a critical piece of this is that the members actually adhere to the policies and change the culture. It's no longer acceptable to take your turn out, your air pack off while you're doing an you know, overhaul. It's, uh, it's no longer acceptable to have dirty turnout gear. Uh, helmet. Black helmets. Yeah, it used to be from that, from smoke, not from not from the color of the helmet. Yeah, from having you know soot on your gear and stuff. That's no longer you know because before, in the old days, you know if you weren't a, a dirty firefighter, you weren't a good firefighter, and that's that's just ridiculous, right? And we're we're trying to we're trying to fix those things. And so it's going to take a cultural shift that everybody understands, and it's actually frowned upon to have a dirty set of turnout gear, especially when we provide two, three sets of turnout gear for each member that there's no reason to have a dirty set of turnout gear. And if you send it off to resource or wherever, you can have it back in 24 hours or 48 hours. That set of dirty gear has been through an extractor and we've moved as much of the soot as we possibly can. So it's incumbent upon the members to adhere to the policies and take advantage of that so we can reduce the likelihood of cancer. It's not gonna be complete foolproof, Guarantee you're not going to develop cancer at some point in time as a result of an exposure on the job. But at the same time, we can minimize that as much as we possibly can. Clean cab initiative and all that stuff. That's that's one thing, too. I'm, I'm noticing a lot of focus on turnout gear, um, but little things kind of get forgotten sometimes, like the helmet uh, or the SCBA pack, you know, like spray it off and throw it right back in, a, in the back of a seat. Or they like clean a, the helmet, but they don't clean that little liner that's just yeah. right on your forehead. Or the neck shroud yeah. that yeah, it yeah. doesn't get washed. You know, like there's these little pieces. Like, I think we have to be very thorough in that uh, if we truly want a clean cab. It's, it's tough. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough ask, especially after you've got your butt whooped fighting a fire all night and you're, now you got to clean all your stuff up too. But it's important. I mean, a little bit extra to keep yourself cancer free or. Yeah, minimize the exposure. Minimize your risk, yeah. yeah. I can certainly understand a, a firefighter coming out of a structure fire, especially any place outside of Phoenix where a bad night for us is 28 degrees. Uh, you go someplace else where it's sub-zero and you're asking somebody to stand in water or get a shower, rinsed off, you know, before you take your gear off and then get into a fire truck. Um, that's going to be a big ask. I understand that. Uh, but I guess it's kind of what do you have planned 10 years from now, oncologist or see your local oncologist, or do you want to have a long, successful, healthy retirement? And really with all this stuff that he's talking about. Son of the late Ricky Pierce and current Phoenix Fire Captain, Chris Pierce. We kind of saw the need for a lot of these things and it really didn't start, it didn't catch on in the organization. It started from the top down in the organization, but really where we've seen this grow is from the bottom up is it truly we, we showed the guys in the academy hey this is like you want to start looking at surviving to the end of your career and it didn't really start with the seasoned captains initially being the first ones coming on board it was the young guys and hitting them really hard and hey you guys need to be showing the example and you guys staying in your coats and just reminding these guys that because everyone that that's sitting in this room came up in a different culture we came up in that, you know, that a badge of honor coming out of a fire, especially as a young member, was being as dirty as possible because it showed that you did the most work. Uh, and then, you know, we all talked about, you know, pig wrecking. Oh, man, we, we came back, no showers. You, you go back and lay down in your bed with the same shirt on. Sometimes in the turnout gear, in this, yeah. like leave your bunker well, gear on. And well, they'll beat you on that one. They're, 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 if you yeah. bring that turnout gear in the house nowadays, they're going to they're gonna light you up. Yeah, yeah we've cultured enough past that, right? Yeah. But uh, the but T-shirt and stuff like that, yeah. Though there was a time uh, our gear was stored, right? You popped out of your out of your bed right into your gear. Yeah. 
right? And they're like, this big size at all the doors. Don't bring that in here. Truly, the the youth of the of our organization is the ones that really said, hey, we don't we don't want to make the mistakes. Like they really are a smarter, uh, more more open to to outside influence of looking at seeing the mistakes that that uh, culturally within the fire service that we've we've seen forever. I would go on that. I don't want that to be me, you know, 20 years from now. Anytime we start a new program, there's there are target, right? Because they're the ones that are going to, they'll push up, right? And so, we, you know, we focus on them a lot at TA. When we start, you know, hood exchange program and stuff, we're working on these guys. Hey, every time you come in, take that hood off, get a, grab a new one, you know, put it on. The, the old, some of the old guys won't do it. Don't worry about it. They're going to give you heat for it, right? That's okay. Right, they're gonna get you. Try to get you to take your SBA off, you know, during overhaul because they don't want they want to take theirs off, and you you make them look bad when you're wearing your. We're like, keep doing it. Yeah, you can break them. And and then he he talked about the uh, just the our turnout gear being clean. Like we've truly built a very robust cleaning service within our organization. That it's a phone call. Uh, we have special bags now that we bag our stuff in so that it's clear. So it's kind of different. Uh, it's gone, and those the guys that run our our turnout cleaning system, they're spot on. Like it is truly out in a day, back in a day. And for a, a city as big as we are, with again the the sixty some odd stations, um, the the their ability to turn that stuff around is what has allowed this program to be successful. Uh, because you're not going four or five six shifts trying to wonder where your stuff is, uh, or, or catching another fire in between and not having any. Turn out you're absolutely all where you're stealing somebody else's. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's been been really good. So I think that brings up a good point about what is it what is it that makes all those programs successful, and I think it's commitment. Director of Fire Education Programs at the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, John Tippett. That's it, and and going back to the event of 1984, it was the commitment of the fire department. And of guys like Tom Bates the day after to say, I'm going to go back to work and I'm going to make it better. That I think is probably the lesson here. And, and flashing it forward to the energy systems, the energy systems of today are the hazmat events of the 70s and 80s. Because it was those things in the 70s and 80s that had people thinking, well, I can't treat this like a room and contents fire because it's doing something different. The fire looks different. It smells different. The smoke smells different. It's not burning the same way. So I... I we would have these occasions where we would try to do it the same way and it didn't work. But then there were also other events where it didn't work, where we said, okay, well, we're not going to do that again and we got to make it better. So for the folks today, um, I mean, just the access to information, you look at the transcript of, of the, of the, of the 84 event and how much it took to get just the spelling of toluene how many different ever, uh, iterations of that we're trying to go through the radio and finally command says to the division or grouper sector or wherever we are in this part of the country that says, come to the command post to spell the word because I can't get it by radio. And, and, I, and I think that is where the launch point of 84 brings us to where we are today. I mean, we, we can, you know, you can talk into this device and get the spelling of the, of the event uh, or whatever. And something back with the, where today, or in 1980, 81, we would get on the scene of calls. And if we didn't know what it was, we got an expert there from the facility. Retired Phoenix fire captain and officer of engineer Ricky Pierce that day in 1984, Tom Bates. We didn't just go blow and go. We made sure we researched it. That was one of the... We got hammered for that all the time. Did you research this? We're, and we put this in our procedures. You researched it, three, three different sources, before you made a decision on what you were going to do. And if we couldn't find it in our Merck manuals and our, all of our hazardous response books and stuff like that, because we had a library, we would get a has, or an expert from the facility to help us out and, and or make phone calls. Speaking of uh, experts on the at the facility, you know today are they are they training these guys in these confined space and hazmat things? Like, do certain facilities have their own response team in, in the area that can if kind they, of? If they're going to have us be their rescue service, they have to allow us access to the facility, 
right? That's an OSHA law, so they have to do that. Uh, we will be the rescue service for anybody within the border of within the city of Phoenix, right? Other cities have to make that determination on their own. But the fire department is not obligated to do confined space rescue. They can say, we will, around the country, there are cities that say, we will not do this. You have to hire a private contractor to do it for you to be OSHA compliant. Uh, you know, that's just part of 1910.146. Yeah, you know, the material safety data sheets, everybody, they were at the facility normally, and they were at the guard shack, and you'd have to send somebody down there to get it. And So when you talk about, well, what would we do today? Hopefully we do the same thing today, that if we don't know something about it, that car 957 or command or somebody says, time out. That's if you have the, if you know that's even going on, because firefighters sometimes do stuff that you don't know they're doing it, and that's when something can happen. Yeah. Big industry is, uh, is pretty compliant. They can't afford not to be. When OSHA changed the confined space rescue standard, they cited five case studies nationwide. Two of them were from Phoenix. One of them was Ricky Pearson. The other was the carbon monoxide on the freeway. On the freeway. Yeah. So two of those were, the, were or out of the five that they cited why they were changing the standard. And they changed their finding structures to, from uh, you know, $10,000 max to $100,000 per occurrence, which means each individual, to make it non-cost effective to, be, uh, to cheat. You know, if you get caught, because uh, a lot of a lot of you know, especially when we get in the trenches and stuff, a lot of that stuff is like the shoring is expensive, and the fines are not very expensive. Maybe we won't do it. Uh, now they've they've pushed it the other way. We're like, you're risking a lot if you don't, you know, let alone killing somebody. Sure. Yeah. So, well, if we go back to the the event, um, it in reading through the transcript. By the time, Tom, your crew got there, it looked like decisions had been made that this was a rescue operation. So that kind of shifts us from uh, we're responding to a hazmat incident. Because I think in the minds of some people, hazmat incident, there's something spilled. There's some kind of noxious fumes that are flowing out uh, into, the, into the community. And there's something's got, some, some, some animal's got to be contained. Whereas this, I, th I think one of the first radio transmissions when you arrive on the scene is bring your saws. So all of a sudden, hazmat, hazmat brain gets left in the truck, now we're into extrication brain. And all of a sudden we're, we're focusing on extracting this individual or we're doing something to the effect that a lot of the whole hazmat thought process kind of get, got parked. Yes. And that, For sure. and, and that, you know, is, and I, and I, you know, I'm reading this as, you know, an outside outsider so many years away from it. But again, at the time of the event, one of the things that Phoenix shared was that our decision-making process got corrupted, not 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 with any malicious intent, but it was you know it, it's a toluene tank, but that almost became secondary to the fact that there was somebody in there, and there was the the misunderstanding of well is it a is it a victim or is it is it a is it a body, well if it's a victim we have to go this route and if it's a body we'd go this route but there was there were even though there was a transmission in there about the the individual probably not being alive I don't think that doesn't look like it was ever broadcast to the masses to say, okay, well, time for a timeout. But it, it just, the focus was rescue. And, and that, you know, ends up where, where we are. And as, and as command, and you gather that information, if, we're, if we learn from it as far as, when you get new information, it might say timeout, let's re-evaluate and, and say that. It's okay to say that. We Let's would do that today, or, yeah, if we had information. What we have here today with this new information. It becomes a new call at yeah. that point. Exactly. It's almost like you're starting a new call. Instead of everybody going down that road, yeah. hey, the guy is not viable. We've touched on quite a few topics today that are relevant to the life safety initiatives of the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Chief Tippett, would you mind elaborating on that for us? You know, on behalf of the foundation, we, we, we couldn't be more thankful of, of your willingness to talk to us <clears throat> and help us with this program. Um, and really, everything we've talked about today touches on a number of the life safety initiatives, which came out of one of the Tampa meetings. So we, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about culture change. There was a shift in the culture of the Phoenix Fire Department and actually the National Fire Service. Um, the empowerment process, you know, I think um, Tom mentioned if, you know, in today, if he re ran this call today and he spoke up and said to the commander, I don't think this is going to be a good thing to do, there might be a, a stop as opposed to, no, we're, we're going down this path. Um, 
So the empowerment process is, is huge. Uh, the training and education initiative that we're talking about is, is also going to be touched. We've already talked about that. This will become a training initiative. And then <clears throat> one of the other initiatives they talk about is investigating near misses and fatalities. So reports were done on this event, but the benefit of being able to actually speak to people and get beyond what showed up on the written paper or you know what took place then, I think brings a whole new focus to what took place. Because as, as you know, Tom mentioned, you know, if you weren't there, it's, it's hard for you to, it's hard, really hard for you to draw conclusions, although we are amazingly effective at Monday morning quarterbacking. You know, having the opportunity to hear from the horses that were there and getting their perspective and having this new mindset of, um, well, if you weren't there, you should really pay attention to what these, these people have to say because they're, what they can offer you could save your life uh, and, and, and maybe change your mind about what things are doing. So um, in that regard, you know, we can't thank you enough. Um, but, you know, supporting the foundation's efforts to, to prevent the preventable death is what we're, what we're looking to do. And um, that's what that kind of this program's all about. So uh, again, thank you so much for your candor and your willingness to talk and uh, your desire to, to, to get the message out because it, it can't be easy for any of you to, to have to revisit this stuff. In conclusion, is there anything you guys would like to add? Does Phoenix Fire Department have any scholarships or benevolent funds or awards given in Engineer Pierce's honor? You know, that's internal for us, the stuff that we do there. We have our own our own internal system for, for honoring somebody. You know, we have we have the, the award system for special operations associated with with Ricky. But uh I think I think for us the training, right? One of the things that we do, we have a website, uh, PhoenixFireOps.com. And you can get on that website, and anything that we have that we that we train on is on there, and anybody can access it. Uh, it's not locked or anything like that. It's just if you want to see what what uh, the PFD is doing on training, and they have, I mean, things from on scene reports, so you learn how to talk on the radio, uh, for, and it's for our own people too. But it's also open to anybody that wants to access it. And extrication stuff, uh, firefighting tactics and strategy, uh, it's all there. We are an open book. Uh, we've always prided ourselves, and if, if, if I got it and you want it, I'll give it to you. We've trained programs, anything we have, right? And some people do this with their with their stuff. I worked hard, and they did, right? They worked hard on their PowerPoint or whatever it was. And uh, but, but we like, break it loose and put it on the website, and, and it's not yours, right? <laughs> and you developed it when you were working, so, yeah, it's really not yours. Yeah, uh, but get it out there and share it, right? Because it doesn't do any good in the closet, right? So... Uh, let, let people have that information. And we do try pretty hard to keep that updated when, whenever we have new training. So we just did a round of like mid-rise stuff and it, we're trying to get that stuff on there. So we do try to add content to it uh, as often as we were able to. It's a, it's a good site. And it's not, it's not perfect. You know, none of them are. And some of the stuff on there is, is a little bit dated. And you're going, hey, take what you want and leave the rest behind. But there's, there is some, there's some good stuff there. So uh, anybody who wants to, phoenixfireups.com. And what about scholarships or charities that folks could donate to? Yeah, a lot of our, our charity stuff uh, is through the local, so the United Phoenix Firefighters Association. Uh, and so they had, essentially they do, through their charities, they kind of have a larger pot that they they pull that into and then uh, they have a number of charities and a number of scholarships that they kind of distribute that out to so if you're looking for a, kind of an individual <laughs> spot that united phoenix firefighters charities Sounds good. Awesome. Uh, all, or the hunter club who's also been right. tremendous tom closing comments i'm just glad that you guys and this is a long time in coming for ricky so that we don't have these incidents happen again uh, it's not a mystery, you know. I don't know if I could have dealt with it years ago, but uh, this was probably good for me. This was probably good therapy. When, when Ricky, when this happened, we changed a lot of things that we do, right? It didn't happen right away, but but it, it instituted a lot of change in the in the the fire service for us, right? Uh, the safety systems that we developed, the, the special operations responder because it was a special ops call, uh, all this kind of stuff grew out of that. And then 2001. Uh, Brett Carver was, was, was killed, right? And we changed the way we do air management. We changed the way we do line management and commercial structures. And we changed the way that we practice maydays. And we changed the way that we do uh, uh, self-rescue, save your own, 
right? Uh, those things, right? We looked at all those things and we made changes. I would, as a progressive department, we 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 look at unfortunate incidents and we try to learn as much as possible and share that with everybody. It's a big deal. Chief Abbott. Absolutely. I'm, we're very appreciative of uh, both of you uh, for coming out and uh, revisiting this. And I appreciate uh, Chief Jameson, uh, Captain Pierce, and Captain Bates for participating with us. Well, in the vein of their contributions, um, the, <clears throat> the foundation has programs um, that uh, a very new program for ICs that, that suffer a line of duty death. Um, there's a, a preemptive part to that, and there's a there's a, a, a post event part to that. There there are uh, incident commanders that are um, have experienced a line of duty death that will make contact with another IC to try to share that burden. Well, that's 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 very cool. Yeah, and then a brand new program that's still in its infancy is the company officer to company officer. So for guys like Captain Bates who lose a member. Um, because each each individual each loss means something different to each individual co- uh, element there. So, you know, originally we had a chief to chief and a coworker, and we thought that worked well. But but then not every incident commander is the fire chief, and the coworker group tends to splinter after a loss in a lot of cases for a variety of reasons. So um, the foundation's programs, IC to IC, and now company officer to company officer, are are there to fill that void, and and I I don't hesitate uh, to say that this event is a catalyst. Now you know, 35 years later, I mean, nothing moves really fast in the fire service, but this this event is another contributing factor to these programs that exist today. So. Um, again, on behalf of the foundation, and I know from my experience in, in, in my career, you, you got me through my career. This, this event was pivotal. With this incident, though, and where we were at in the incident, there was a lot of blaming going on, okay? And I probably participated in some of that with the command officers in that they did some things out of kilter to the organization. They went behind our backs, pulled people off the tanks. They didn't tell us about those things. So yeah, there was some name calling, uh, finger pointing, pointing because it was wrong. I guess maybe I probably wish I wouldn't have done that now. Because at that point, it didn't matter. You know, after the incident, does it matter? All that matters is that we learn from it and don't do it again because I can't go back with the certain individuals. <clears throat> and so that caused some riff, okay? I guess that's human nature. There's always in-house finger pointing going to happen, right? You can't, it's just, you can't stop that, right? But there's, there's a difference between in-house finger pointing and then open warfare or, you know, where people are, are talking out loud in big groups and sharing information and, uh, I don't think that our department did a very good job of managing that in, in 84. And I think in 2001, they did a really good job of managing that when people started pointing fingers uh, when Brett Tarver's death. And uh, the, the union president and the fire chief got together and said, don't you do it, right, because it's harmful, right? And sometimes we're cannibalistic, right? We'll eat our own. And they're like, don't do it. Uh, and it's pretty much stopped. I think we see that in a lot of those events. There's a, and, and I do know there was an encounter with Chief Brunacini uh, at, a, at one of the conferences I was attending where somebody asked him about Charleston. This was before I went to work there. Uh, they said, well, what do you think about the Sofa Superstore fire? And without blinking an eye, he said, I wasn't there. Yeah. So, I mean, because I think what they were waiting for, the group was waiting for him to expound on all the things that he could have said. And he just basically said, I wasn't there. And that, I mean, that just shut the dialogue down. And Maybe that's a really great piece of advice. Well, that's a very good yeah. piece of advice. I wasn't there. You know, we talked about that. Yeah. You know, and and even after you figure it all out, what are you gonna What are you gonna say? Right. What do you want? You just want to pick a fight? Yeah. You right. You want to make someone feel bad? I already feel bad. Sure. Yeah, it doesn't change the outcome. Captain Pierce, is there anything you want to add? Yeah. So I think right, really the most important part of all this is. Is honestly, I wouldn't be sitting here today uh, if it wasn't for what 
these people did after my dad's incident, right? With with the things that they they cared about and and again op the openness of of I guess my dad's incident that really was able to have have me I don't know feel closure pretty early on in my 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 life and he they really gave that to us uh, very very early and so having that you know you guys are allowing us to to kind of take this time to to revisit my dad's incident and and kind of bring some information back to, to light on it. Uh, I, again, I think that that's one. I think it's very cathartic for all of us to to talk about these things, and to know that the information continues to go out and people continue to learn from it. And so, what I think more the most important thing coming out of this incident, uh, to anyone listening to it, is that you have to remember that the incidents that affect you and the things that can hurt you and your members aren't just in your department. The things that are killing us here are the same things that are killing us all over the country, all over the world. And so taking some time and reading these NIOSH reports, reading these line of duty rep reports, uh, going back and researching the, the things that, the hazards that are out there, that's the best thing that you can do for your members is to learn and be aware and start training on the things that are getting us and the things that have gotten us in the past. If we ignore them, they'll come back and bite us again. So it's just taking that time uh, to really educate yourself because that's that's the best thing that we can do for the next generation is to set them up uh, to learn from our mistakes uh, so that we can save people better as we we go forward so and i think that this has been a great forward from that and i appreciate tommy's candor and uh and and everyone here for for participating in this and, and helping us get that message out yeah we shouldn't have to re learn something if you can present it to them here. I, everybody shouldn't have to go on a Ricky Pierce call. They don't have to experience, you know, bring it out, show them the film. You know, they might see that one day. They might be able to make a decision to where it doesn't happen to them. So that slide, we always, that's what something as a safety officer and so I guess, and you get a lot of years on the job and stuff. I've seen that before. This is what's going to happen. You know, this is this is going to come down. This is going to this. This is, that's how you make your decisions. So if we can give everybody a slide projector and have that, it'll help them, and they get to go home after their shift. We really appreciate all these guys out there in Arizona have done and continue to do for the firefighting industry. We're consistently impressed by their level of commitment to the craft. Thank you all. And these really important pieces of fire service history we're discussing. They're the foundation of our industry's future. Not just the future for firefighter safety, but also the future of those affected by these incidents. These discussions give them a platform to tell their stories. They give them a platform to heal. We're just truly honored to be part of all of it. A special thank you to this entire discussion panel today. You guys were truly remarkable. A quick reminder to check out AfterTheFirePodcast.com for all things connected to this and all of our episodes. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Also, firehero.org has a link now to sign up for the podcast newsletter. If you'd like to receive inside info about After the Fire, please go there and sign up now. Well, that's all for this one. Join us in Episode 5 when we discuss the lithium-ion battery storage facility explosion near misses of 2019 in Surprise, Arizona. This is a jaw-dropping conversation, and given the rise of lithium-ion batteries, this is one that is 100% pertinent to every single firefighter in the world today. Take care of yourself, take care of each other, and we'll see you after the fire. Mm -hmm.